everyone, uh, and thanks for your time. Uh, and Malta said it uh, very nicely at the start, it is really a, a very unique process, uh, the IPCC uh, and the IPCC approval sessions as well. And uh, there were really few people in the room uh, who were more engaged in uh, forging those solutions with governments and with the other authors, authors than Malta, in fact. So uh, really, uh, if you want uh, insights on how that all works, um, uh, you'll be happy uh, I think Malta will also be happy to to discuss and I'm imagining. Um, so it is a unique process because this is an assembling of uh, insights from the underlying report. Um, and, uh, and the synthesis report carries enormous weight because it is the, the sort of crowning bringing together of all of these insights from all of these reports, thousands of pages, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of government and expert comments uh, over seven years. And so what gets reflected in that report really uh, carries some weight and of course also because it is formally approved and adopted by the governments of the world. Um, Everyone has sort of um, very um, uh, colloquially uh, summarized the thing, and I borrow the words of a very senior colleague in the IPCC and say, we're up the proverbial creek, but we do have a paddle. Um, that's really the key message uh, from, from that uh, report. So uh, emissions are rising, uh, still rising, but the pace has slowed of emissions growth. Um, the report assesses that billions of tons of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, per year are being avoided, are not being emitted because of the direct effect of policies and laws on other measures to constrain emissions and reduce emissions. So there's an it's no longer hypothetical in terms of reducing emissions, it's actually happening. Uh, 18 countries can be identified of having uh, reducing emissions substantially and, and consistently reducing emissions uh, over time and the aggregate effect uh, globally of emissions uh, policies uh, is a very significant one. More importantly, looking forward, uh, the report assesses that the technical opportunity to cut emissions the world over uh, amounts to um, half. We can have emissions globally between now and 2030 at incremental costs of less than 100 US dollars per ton of carbon dioxide. Now, 100 US uh, per carbon per ton of carbon, di uh, carbon uh, dioxide equivalent uh, is about four times the magnitude of the current price in the Australian emissions offset market. Uh, and it's in the rough order of the EU emissions trading price right now. So it's not uh, a prohibitively um, high price or anything like that. And if consistently, uh, if policy effort was consistently applied right across the world, every sector, every country, then we'd see a halving of global emissions right now. We're unlikely, of course, to see that with, um, with the way that things are presently organized, but that potentially is there. Uh, and the name of the game is, of course, to harness as much as possible um, of that of that potential. The reason that potential is so great is that uh, fu the fundamental reason is that technologies have become a lot cheaper. Again, the report assesses that and reflects the tremendous cost reductions that we've seen uh, in technologies such as solar, wind, electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, another important message is that policy instruments are there, have been used, are tried and tested, and can be designed uh, to meet many other objectives, uh, and, and crucially can be designed to meet equity objectives, to shield lower income er earners from adverse uh, impacts um, of um, on their income uh, and standards of living. Um, if scaled up, those policy instruments that are already available and that are broadly applied in many countries could indeed result in very deep global emissions cuts. However, very big gaps remain in policy application and in coverage of policies and in stringency. Uh, and that comment, uh, okay, backtrack a little bit. The IPCC does not provide assessment of policy settings and effectiveness in individual countries. Uh, but if we can extrapolate a little, then that statement, of course, would apply to Australia as well, increasing uh, deployment and plans for deployment of policies, but gaps uh, remain uh, and are set to continue uh, to remain. So over coming years, 
uh, tremendous uh, need and potential to do better there. Um, I'll end on uh, some international aspects here. So the report assesses that the financing gaps or the difference between what is currently deployed in terms of investment in clean energy technology and related systems and what would need to be deployed in terms of financial investments in, in clean, uh, low emission systems is, a, is about three to six times. So uh, we need to scale up that kind of investment by three to six times the world over. And that gap is especially large in developing countries. And that is, of course, well, not of course, but to tell you the fact that um, this is among the most contentious aspects, in fact, in any international interactions on climate change. Um, and certainly also was, once again, in this approval session, um, who should pay for strong climate action in the interplay between rich and poor countries. Uh, so that's the major touch point. Uh, of course, uh, developing countries not having been responsible for most of the accumulated greenhouse gas emissions already, nevertheless, uh, for the most part, said to be uh, suffering most from future climate change and being least able to deal with it um, and, and asking, demanding uh, financial uh, and other assistance from rich countries, which is not forthcoming to anywhere near the extent uh, that it is needed. Thanks very much. Terrific. Thank you so much.